Hi everybody, I'm Rick Beato. On today's Everything Music, I'd like to take you behind the scenes on what I do on a day-to-day -day basis in my music production career. Today I'm working with a band called Supervillain that's from Spokane, Washington, and we're going to show you how we track a band live to tape. This may be a two-parter, depends on how long it is here, uh, but let's get started. <laughs> Okay, let me take you into the drum miking setup. So the kit that we have, I'll show you here, is a hodgepodge of different drums from the 50s and 60s. We have a Ludwig, we have a Ludwig 16 by 16 floor tom, we have a Leedy 24 by 14 kick drum, and we have a Slingerland 14 by 10 rack tom. As you can see here, on the outside of the kick drum, there is an AKG D30, and on the inside of the kick, we have an Electro Voice RE20. The toms, as you've seen from some of my other videos, are being mic'd with two different microphones. There's a MD-421 on the top, and on the bottom, using a Y cable out of phase, is an SM-57. Both the toms are top and bottom mic. You can see right here the 421, and you can see the 57 on the bottom. The bottom mic is out of phase on the toms, meaning that the phase is reversed, the polarity is reversed, so that the Y cable is giving us a perfectly in phase picture of the tom from the top and bottom. I have this described in my Brendan O'Brien video where I go into more detail and I show you some close-up videos, so go check out that video. So here you can see the whole drum setup. So on the overheads, I'm gonna pan up a little bit here, I've got some KM84 Neumann mics, and on the hi-hat, I've got a, um, I have an old AKG 452EB, which is a great old small diaphragm condenser mic. If you look at the ride symbol here, I have it mic'd from underneath with an SM57 pointing right at the bell. I learned that trick from Jim Scott, who engineered a lot of the great Tom Petty records and, and actually engineered a lot of Rick Rubin records. The ride mic is out of phase with the overheads because it's facing in the opposite direction. And the cymbal being on top of it is shielding it from all the cymbal wash from the overhead. So it really works well on a number of levels. The band I'm working with this week is a band from Spokane, Washington. They're called Supervillain. This is the lead singer and guitarist, Scott. He's gonna tell you a little bit about the band, Scott. Yeah, we're all from Spokane, Washington, Pacific Northwest, and uh, we're a three-piece band. We like to play loud rock music through vintage analog tube gear, and we're excited to record a tape with Rick. The mic setup that we have here is with an old Fender Deluxe amp that was modded by Peter Stroud, who's a good friend of mine. We have it mic'd with an SM57 and an MD421 Sennheiser. This amp has an incredibly killer sound. You'll hear it here in a few minutes. Okay, Scott, I want you to talk about your pedal board now, okay? All right, so we have a lot of low end on the guitar side here, standard tuner, um, the boss one everyone has. I've got a Tone Reaper, Earthquaker devices, fuzz. It's a nice fatter fuzz. It gives a really full sound. Bobby does a lot of um, higher lead parts, so I like to complement it with more of an octave sound with some of our, um, with some of our rhythms. Um, standard OCD full tone, good standby. This is a really interesting pedal. It's a rare um, Arian octave. I picked up for ten bucks. Oh yeah, I know and, that pedal. <clears throat> um, it's kind of one sought after. Lucked out, love it. Um, this baby right here, uh, Josh Homme, Queens of the Stone Age, uses one, so I had to have one. Um, I just love it. I use it as a slight echo most of the time. And then this Holy Grail reverb. Um, I just really love the the sound. It's an original series one. Um, they're hard to find, but uh, I got a good one. And then uh, Super Trem by Full Tone, which I have a love-hate relationship, but I really like it um, on our slower songs. And this puppy right here I haven't used yet, but I'm excited to try that one out soon. It sure looks cool. Yeah, a lot of blinking lights. This is Jeff, the drummer. He's going to tell you a little bit about himself, but he's playing this kit that I just talked about that's a hodgepodge of Slingerland, Leedy, um, Ludwig, 
and a risen snare. So before I came down, I had talked with Rick about um, the, the equipment that he had, drums and stuff like that, and he has an awesome selection, so I didn't really need to bring much. The only thing I really did bring was my set of Constantinople hi-hats, which um, I take everywhere. They're, they're the most amazing thing I've ever played. Um, there's just something about the naturalness of it. There's no tinniness. There's no. There's none of that high-pitched crap that comes through. And so, almost at first, when you hear them with your ear, it sounds a little dead, um, compared to some of the cheaper, the cheaper hi hats that'll punch through and get kind of annoying. But as soon as you hear it on the on the recording, it, you realize that it's it's a it's a recording hi hat and it's it's flawless. So I'm really really pumped to to play with these this week. This is Bobby. He's the bass player. He's playing a Rickenbacker 4003 bass. You want to tell him about your setup a little bit? Yeah, um, I kind of, I've never played bass in a band before, so this was my first time getting a bass. I actually didn't own a bass uh, up until I got this guy, and it just kind of worked out and fell into my lap, and I've always wanted a 4003 aesthetically, but now I've become kind of used to it, because like the volume controls are opposite of like a Les Paul style, uh, you know, instead of being volume, volume, tone, tone, it's volume on the bottom, and then it's got the three-way selector switch, and these pickups are really microphonic, which work really well with some of the octave pedals I use for tracking, which I'll get into a little bit here, but, um, yeah, I'm just, I've become really used to it, so it's kind and of become the sound of Supervillain. And you use flat-wound strings? Yes, all, of course, yeah, I love flat-wounds. Well, tell them why you would like, like flat-wounds. They just got more, like, thump to them, uh, I was playing a show one time and a guy went in the restroom and he's like, man, I could still hear your bass like beating through the walls at me. And he's like, how do you do that? And I was like, I just, honestly, I just, it's flat ones. I love flat ones. I'm a big proponent of flat on strings being a jazz player originally. And uh, a lot of the records that you hear from the 60s were played on flat on strings because they were actually more prevalent back in those days. Um, let's talk about your pedal board here. So I just, all my pedals powered with the ISO brick from MXR. It's just a good isolated power supply. And then I, uh, I go into the just tuner, out of the tuner into a Keeley four knob compressor. So it's my compressed signal going through the pedals. Pretty standard. I use the AC booster from Exotic Effects just for my overdrive. It's just an amp, real, sounds like a tube amp cranked because I keep my bass dry signal pretty clean. And then the kind of the sound of Supervillain, I use two MXR submachines, one set octave up with more sub octave, one set just more strictly as a fuzz with a little bit of octave on it. And then uh, one thing I do different as a bass player, I use a tremolo pedal on a, on a few tunes. Again, just trying to fill up space because we are a three piece. So pretty, pretty simple, not a ton of pedals. And then this uh, old MIJ Super Phaser from Boss, um, just that real low oscillating, again, just to fill up space on a couple tunes where Scott drops out, so. Cool. Pretty standard. Great. Okay, for the bass DI, this is a Zod Audio DI made. As far as the bass DI is concerned, this is a Zod Audio tube bass DI that was made by my friend Dan Durlo. This is one of the best sounding tube DIs I've ever heard, and I, highly recommend it to people. You can contact Dan. I'll put a um, link to his uh, website in the description below, but this is a fantastic sounding bass DI. Here's the other side of the DI, as you can see. It's incredibly stout. It is a great, great sounding fat tube DI that has really great top end too. That's Zod Audio. Okay, you guys, this is Ken. He's hey. been working with me for 16 years now, and uh, he's going to talk to you about tape level that we're, we have on the uh, on the drums here or on all the instruments. So you can see, this is everything that we have right now. We have a kick. We have two kick mics. We have a snare mic, uh, uh, top and bottom. We have hat rack, floor tom, ride, two overheads like everyone else, two rooms, and then we also have. Um, we were using a a vocal mic out there for our vocalists, but. We're actually using it now as a drum mic, so you can see how it's how it's going there. Um, so it's turned into a drum mic. And uh, as for the levels, trying to get everything in, we we set our levels basically like we normally do when we were getting when we were working with just Pro Tools. But going into tape, we want to make sure that we listen to it. We want to make sure that it's you know not hitting the tape too hard. Um, so every time we, we got an instrument like the kick or something like that, we would take a look and see where it's hitting. To be honest, this is probably hitting a little bit below where, where it should. Um, yesterday it seemed like it was hitting it hotter. I wonder if it's playback, but, um, 
but while it's recording, it was hitting it a little bit hotter. I bet if we if we had him play right now. Just so you know, these are not peak lights. These are just recording lights. Go ahead, play, Jeff. Play. So when we're getting our kick, uh, depending on how hard he's hitting, we're getting about zero here uh, on, on a lot of his harder hits, maybe one on some of the harder hits. Uh, we're trying not to, to hit tape too hard so that it fuzzes out. We don't want the kick to sound all fuzzy and super compressed, but we want that tape sound to it. Same thing with everything else. We want that tape sound, the compression that comes off of the tape when you hit it harder, but we don't want it to fuzz out. Uh, you could do that for an effect, but we're not trying to get that for this. So you can pretty much see where everything's hitting. Our, our overheads are a lot lower than, than you would with a kick. We're trying to keep them around between 10 and 6. And sometimes that snare hits a little bit harder on the overhead, so you're going to see that you know go a little bit higher, especially on on the right side where the snare is, where that overhead mic is. Um, our rooms are a little bit hotter, but that's fine. Everything, nothing's peeking out, nothing's going up on on onto plus three, nothing's slamming. The, the rooms are getting uh, are getting some transformer compression too because yep. of the way the mic breeze we're going through. So yeah. We don't have our bass and our guitar going right now. It's just uh, just all drums. But yeah, that's that's how we're doing. He's not even playing his hat right now. Okay, let me talk about why we use tape. One of the main reasons is the tape compression on the drums, especially drums and bass. It sounds incredibly good on. But let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So I've taken a snare hit and a bass drum hit, and I will play you the hit directly from Pro Tools, and then I'm going to hit play the hit that's come off tape so you can hear the difference in the sound. Okay, so here's a bass drum off Pro Tools. Play it again. This is the same bass drum hit, but this is off tape. You can hear the, the compression that the tape is doing. There's more background uh, sound that's been brought up. It slams harder. It's got more low mids. Here's the non-tape. Totally different sound. Now, I'm gonna uh, do the same with the snare drum. This is a snare drum played directly from Pro Tools. It's a great sounding snare, great sounding hit. But... And here it is off of tape. Those are level match, but it just has so much more uh, background ambience and length to it because of the tape compression. It's literally compressing the sound. Here's un... This is directly into Pro Tools. Kind of boring. Here's off tape. Okay, now I'm going to show you what they look like. Let me show you the difference between the compressed, the tape compression, and the straight into Pro Tools. This is the straight into Pro Tools. If you look at the back end of the waveform versus this one that's off of tape, you can just see the width of the of the bass drum hit here. It is much, much wider and longer. It's got more sustain. So, once again, there's the one off tape, and there's the one straight into Pro Tools. This is a great example of the difference between the tape one, which is up here. Look at the first part of the transients here, how fat they are. Look how skinny they are here. Almost wimpy <laughs> looking. Uh, you can see the tape compression right here. You can see how this, how it's fat back in this part of the wave, but this is very thin. These are very thin, even though this is a, this is a snare bottom mic. You really can see it in the snare top mic, especially. Well, you can see it in both. Just look at the, the difference in the same hit that's tape compression for you that's why it sounds better anybody that tells you that it doesn't sound different hasn't worked with tape okay we're going to take a listen to the band actually tracking out in the live room this is jonas hey he came here from canada to assist us with this session he's actually from england though but he's actually taking the shot right now so let's let's check out the band
best I can It'll be soon, it'll be soon Stay tuned for part two of the rest of our tracking session tomorrow where I'll be talking about how I'm EQing the bass, the guitars, and drums, and we'll show you some more live shots on what we're doing. I'm Rick Beato.